I wasn't slotted for tonight, but uh, Brother Rodney had to uh, do something with his, his job, so he wasn't able to be with us tonight. So I told him I would fill in, and I don't have anybody who's in the book. <laughs> so I thought I would talk about John Huss tonight, who's probably my Reformation hero, uh, who's inspired me probably more than anybody, uh, historical, historical figures at least, um, in, our, in my ministry. And so I have quite a bit of artwork that I will get here whenever my office gets finished and I put it up on the wall. But this is uh, this one I ha actually had in my office today. Uh, it's my favorite one. I've, I bought a, uh, him back when we were in Czech Republic. I found it at an antique store. And there's a little note on here. It was from 1904. So it's pretty old. But it's a pretty cool picture of when he was at, actually at the stake. And then I have two... I have two other larger ones, one he, when he was on trial at, in Constance, Germany, and then I have another one, uh, what was the other one? Oh, when he was preaching, in, of him preaching in Bethlehem Chapel in Prague, so, but they're very large pieces, so I don't know if they'll go in my office, or I thought maybe in the hallway outside my office, I'm not sure yet, and then I have another one or two smaller ones, so uh, anyways, uh, you might be interested in, in looking at this a little bit later. But John Huss uh, was the Czech Republic's most famous reformer. In fact, uh, preceding him was uh, a guy named Matthias uh, Zianova. Uh, he was actually a, a powerful preacher. And then preceding him was um, Jan Milic of Kromizis, which is the town we ministered in. He was, the, he was considered the father of the Czech Reformation. And it was inspired by men who sat under a man by the name of Conrad Waldheiser from Vienna. He was a German-speaking preacher who came through. Now, all these guys were Roman Catholic at the time, but he came in the Czech Republic. And the focus was preaching in the language of the people, because at this time, people would go to the Roman Catholic Church, and the messages were in Latin. They had no idea what the priest was saying. Only the priests themselves knew it, because they studied it. But the common person had no idea uh, what the message was, so they went home really with nothing. And when they got home, they didn't have a Bible they could read because the Bible wasn't in the language of the people. So the people really had little to no access to the Word of God. And so it was these men who began focusing on preaching the truth, preaching the truth of what the Bible says in the language of the people. And John Huss was born somewhere in the later 1300s, and he grew up in a, in a, poor, fam with, in a poor family as peasants in southwestern Bohemia, which would be like southwestern Czech Republic today. And his father died when he was young, so he grew up without a father figure, and he was raised by his mother, and her aspirations was for him to be a priest, because that was a respected uh, profession then, uh, you know, priests at that time were the most highly respected men in society. And Huss said that he, as a kid, desired to be a priest because they dressed well, they had nice clothing, uh, they had money, and they were well respected by people. So that was his ambitions to be a, a priest. But he said they were so poor that when he was a kid, he would, when he would eat his bowl of peas, which I don't like, but he obviously did, he would make a spoon out of his bread, and then he said when he was done eating his peas, he would eat the spoon, which was the bread that he shaped into a spoon. But he, he grew up poor, he was an average student, but he had a very magnetic personality, and he was, a, he was good at oratory, he was a good public speaker. So he rose uh, in influence, he became a respected te teacher at Charles University, and he eventually became the rector of the university. But more importantly, he through his preaching ministry, he became the preacher at Bethlehem Chapel because they built a chapel in Prague, not because they didn't have church buildings, because there were church buildings uh, around the city. And if you go there today, you'll see Catholic churches all over the place that date back, you know, five, six, seven hundred years. So there were Catholic churches available, but they built Bethlehem Chapel specifically for preaching, kind of a squarish rectangular square building it's actually about the size of this room isn't it i would say it's about the size of our auditorium and they would get three thousand people standing room only 
to take out our pews and bring in 3,000 people. And that's literally, they would pack the place out because they built it for people to hear the, the preaching uh, of the word of God in their own language, in the vernacular. And they named it Bethlehem Chapel because the word Bethlehem obviously comes from Hebrew and it means house of bread, Bethlehem, so house of bread. And they said, this is where people are going to be fed the word of God. Because they weren't being fed in their Catholic churches because they didn't understand the, the, the messages. So people came in droves to hear the preaching of the word of God in, in their own language, to hear messages, to hear what the Bible says as though they've never heard before. And Huss was a powerful preacher, and he turned the city upside down. Actually, he turned Europe, in a sense, upside down. Because he began preaching of, against the evils that he saw in the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic church, church essentially taught that it was made up of the priests and the cardinals and the bishops and the pope. And, and they were the authorities. And, and they were the interpreters of scripture. So the common man, even if you had a Bible and even if you knew Latin, you couldn't be trusted to interpret scripture. No, only they could interpret scripture for the people. Well, Huss didn't agree with that. He said, Scripture must be our highest authority, and everyone should be able to read and study the Bible in their own language, because he believed in freedom of the conscience, that people uh, should live according to their conscience, uh, but it should be informed by the Scriptures. And this was, uh, this was not popular. And beyond that, he preached against the immorality amongst the priests. Uh, they were... Uh, they plundered the people, uh, they took people's money, uh, they claimed to control heaven and earth, to control heaven with their tongues, you know, they could release somebody out of purgatory if you gave enough money or whatever, and he preached against indulgences and, um, and a lot of the vices among the clergy, a lot of immorality among the clergy. And so Hus quickly became very unpopular in the Roman Catholic Church, but very popular among the populace, among the people. And so because of his influence in the city and the, the, the number of people that were coming to Bethlehem Chapel to hear him preach and the things that he was saying about them and about their sin, about their wickedness, an interdict was placed on Prague. The Pope placed an interdict on Prague, which meant that there, there was a ban on church ceremonies like funerals and weddings and christenings as long as Hus resided in Prague. So Huss didn't want the people to live that way just because of him. He didn't want them to not be able to have funerals and weddings and, all, and these other ceremonies. So he chose to go out into the countryside and into hiding. And that's where he did much of his writing. And his most famous writing is De Ecclesia, which is in Latin for the church. And it's an amazing book, and you can actually get it in, in English. It's, I think it's only in English and Latin. But uh, there you can see his heart was filled with a passion for Scripture. Because the more he studied the Scripture, the more he realized the, the false teaching and the immorality and the injustices that was carried out and practiced by the Roman Catholic Church of the day. So he preached uh, against the immorality. He preached for people to have the right to interpret scripture for themselves. And he was uh, labeled as a heretic by the Roman Catholic Church. And so the, he was called to come to Constance, Germany, which is in southern Germany. And the emperor told him, Huss, if you go to Germany, I promise I will provide safety and protection for you. Because he was afraid that if they, he goes there, you know, he would be killed, which is ultimately what happened. So Huss went to Constance, Germany, and I had the privilege to go there a couple years ago. It was really amazing. We stood at the rock where they believe he was burned at the stake, and it was very sobering. And uh, he was placed in a prison cell, which is now a hotel. They've turned the prison that he was in prison into a hotel today. And if you want to stay in the room that he was in, which is this little, almost its own little building attached to it, I'm sure you can pay a high dollar and you can, you can stay there. But uh, 
So he was called upon to recant of his teachings. And his response was, he said, if any man in the church can instruct me from sacred scripture or by sound reasoning, I am most willing to yield, for from the outset of my studies I have laid this down as my rule, that whenever in any matter I perceive a sounder reason than the one I was moved by, I would gladly and humbly recede my former opinion, knowing well that the things we know are much less numerous than the things which we are ignorant of. Because he said that uh, what he had come to know, he came to know from Scripture, and he held to Scripture as his highest authority. And so he sought to defend his teaching from the Bible, but they didn't want to hear him. They just wanted to silence him. And they would not listen to his appeals to listen to his teaching. He said, you know, if you can find any error, if you can point out any error that I've taught from the Bible, show me. And they weren't interested in opening the Bible. They just wanted to get rid of him. And so when they would not listen to him, he said, well, I appeal to Christ alone. And on July 6th, actually a week ago today, it was on last Wednesday, it was July 6th, and the year 1415, about, was that 607 years ago, he was burned at the stake. He was condemned uh, for his teachings, and when he was given one ch last chance to recant, he said, God is my witness that the things charged against me I never preached. And the same truth of the gospel which I have written, taught, and preached, drawing upon the sayings and positions of the holy doctors, I am ready to die today. And so he stood firm. He didn't flinch in the face of adversity. He wasn't willing to compromise what he believed the scriptures to, to teach. And it said as the fire started burning around him that he sang, he was singing. He sang a song, Christ, thou son of the living God, have mercy upon me. And, uh, and he died uh, burnt, being burnt there at the stake. And Martin Luther, 100 years later, <clears throat> came on the scene. And it's been said, it's kind of a legend, <clears throat> not sure how true it is, but it's been said that Huss said, today you cook a goose, because his last name Huss means goose, if you translate it in Czech language. <clears throat> he said, today you, you burn a goose, but in 100 years, a swan will come whose voice you will not be able to silence. And of course, about 100 years later was Martin Luther. Now, it's interesting because Martin Luther, uh, he was always taught that Huss was the arch heretic. And one day he was studying in the library in Erfurt, Germany, and he came across some of the writings of Huss. So out of curiosity, he thought, oh, I want to see what the arch heretic wrote. So he opens Huss's writings and he's reading them. And he was like, wow, you know, what would move the council to burn such an able expositor? Of scripture so he was kind of perplexed like why would they burn a man at the stake for these things so he closed the books he thought you know because Huss's name was held as a great abomination at that time by the Catholic Church and so he thought well he must have written these things before he became a heretic <laughs> and later Huss uh, actually in, in Germany at this time Huss's name he, he Huss was considered worse than a Jew a Tartar a Turk and a Sodomite that was what uh, was said at the time but later <clears throat> Luther did a little bit more study and came to realize that the reading the writings that he actually read in the library are the things that Huss was burned at the stake for so then he said we are all Hussites him, me, you know, Luther, and all my followers, we are all Hussites without knowing it. We didn't know it, but we're all Hussites because we all believe the same thing. We all preach the same thing, that Scripture is our highest authority. And Huss has gone down in history as being known as a preacher of the truth. In fact, the Czech motto, motto, like in English, you know, you pull out a coin, our motto is what? In God we trust. Well, the motto of the Czech Republic is Pravda Vítězí, which is truth prevails. And it comes from Huss's preaching and writing. So that's the motto today, but it's hardly held by anybody in the country other than a few believers. Because most people, you go out on the streets and you talk to people today, and uh, you, you use the word truth, and they'll tell you, well, you know, everybody has their own truth. 
You know, that's postmodernism. That's what's being taught today in the universities. You know, who are you to tell me the truth? How do you know that you have the truth? Uh, that's what liberals would tell us in the Czech Republic. Uh, how can you say this is what the Bible means when you could be wrong? Maybe your interpretation's wrong. So who are you to know the truth? So that's a liberal way to try to dismiss the truth. But Huss has many quotes speaking about how he was willing to die for the truth and live for the truth. And his whole ministry was about preaching the truth of Scripture. And what's uh, interesting is the, the later his writings, the, the closer he is to Scripture, you know, because he was coming out of a time of, ref, of, of incredible corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. And I know some people, they're like, oh, you know, Huss, you know, he was a Catholic guy and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, well, what would you have been at the time? <laughs> you're, in a, you're in a world where the whole church, the system is, is wedded with a local government, the, you know, and, uh, and they're telling you what to believe, what not to believe. And you start reading the, learning the language of the Bible, you start reading the Bible, you start seeing it teaches something that everybody else says that it doesn't. So then you start preaching what the Bible says. And so, you know, his theology was in development. He was martyred, I think, when he was about 44. So I can only imagine if he would have lived another 20 years. Uh, he never preached, you know, the doctrine of justification by faith alone, like Luther and some of the later reformers, because that came about 100 years later. But Huss's generation led to the uh, focus on sola scriptura, which is, scripture alone the authority of scripture and they laid the groundwork they laid the foundation upon which really the whole reformation was built upon the authority of scripture and so today we hold to the authority of scripture we hold this sola scriptura scripture alone we don't look to the popes we don't look to the priests we don't look to the local preacher we look to the word of god uh, it is our source of authority and so everything that we are to preach from this pulpit or any anywhere is to be founded upon the word of God and we must be just as committed to the truth as Huss and many of the reformers because we are living in an age where when truth is perishing in our land and if you turn open your Bibles to Jeremiah ch chapter 4 we'll just read a few passages out of a few chapters this, this evening this is really nothing new. What's taking place in our day, what took place in Huss's day, took place in the days of Judah, before Judah went into exile. I left my preaching Bible at home, so I got an ESV Bible, but I got possibly NAS translation in my notes, so I have no idea what, I think it's New American Standard as I'm going to be reading from here. Um, <clears throat> But in Jeremiah chapter 4, the Lord here is describing Judah in a time where they were on the precipice of invasion by the Babylonians. And judgment was coming upon them. But look at what the Lord says, obviously through the prophet Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. He said, If you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight then you shall not be moved. And you shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and in him they shall glory. So here the Lord is calling upon Judah to return to him, to return to to the worship of the true and the living God, to lay aside, to put away their abominations, which would, be, which would have been their idol worship, and to return to the Lord in truth, in judgment, and in righteousness. And at this time, the nation was unwilling to repent. It had abandoned the truth, and now it was incurring the judgment of God. And this is exactly what we're seeing in our country. I, I mentioned it on Sunday, but an article came out last week that only 20% of people in America today believe the Bible is the Word of God. Whereas in the 1980s, it was in the 40s, 40 some percent. Well, if you turn over to the next chapter, Jeremiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, the Lord again addresses the issue of truth. He says, Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, see now and know. 
and seek in her open places if you can find a man. If there is anyone who executes judgment, who seeks the truth, and I will pardon her. Though they say, as the Lord lives, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not your eyes on the truth? So here Jeremiah emphasizes the truth that was abandoned in his day. Notice he says here, the Lord's eyes are on the truth. We are to be people who live and die by the truth. God's eyes are on the truth. Our eyes are to be on the truth. And the Lord says here, he couldn't, he says, see if you can find a man who seeks the truth. We are to be people who pursue the truth. And that was John Huss's mission. His mission in life was to be a truth teller and was to know the truth. And that's what God has called us to, is to live by his word. And if you go over to Jeremiah chapter 7, you see why the judgment comes very clearly. In verse 28, it says, So you shall say to them, This is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. So now he describes truth as having perished in the land. And so the nation was coming under the judgment of God. And this is what was taking place in Europe. I mean, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church had corrupted the gospel, had distorted the truth, was hiding the truth from people, wouldn't let, didn't want the people to have the Bible in their own language. So what did they do to the people translating the Bible in the language of the people? Well, they slaughtered them. They burned them at the stake. Uh, and much blood was shed so you and I can have the Bible in our language. I mean, there's a lot of bloodshed so we can have the Bible in English. A lot of bloodshed so people could have the Bible in Czech and some of the, these other languages that was translated into back then. Because Satan is an enemy of the truth. And the first thing he did when Adam and Eve was in the garden was he got Adam and Eve to what? Question God's word. Has God truly said? He always begins by attacking the truth. He always begins by attacking the word of God. He wants to silence it. He wants to lay it aside. Uh, was it Voltaire? Am I saying the right person's name? Who was a French atheist? I, I might be saying the wrong person's name. I'm trying to mind blank. But anyways, he, uh, he was an atheist, and he, his objective was to banish the Bibles on the earth. Well, after he died, his house turned into a Bible printing press. <laughs> so, uh, God's word will prevail. And it's forever settled in heaven, and it is our highest authority. And then if you look over in Jeremiah chapter 9, it says in verse 3, And like their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. I mean, how many lies do you hear each day? When you turn on... CNN every night or one of the news stations. How many lies do you think you're going to hear? It says that they bend their bow, they have bent their tongues for lies. They are not valiant for the truth on the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. You know, the further a people are from, from God, the less truth you will find. So the further our culture goes away from the Bible, the less truth you're going to hear. Um, I mean, When's the last time you heard a preacher on primetime television? But how many of us grew up hearing Billy Graham on primetime TV when we were kids? That's not ever going to happen again. You know, we live in a society that has abandoned the truth. And even churches are abandoning the truth. I had a lady write me this week and uh, said that she's thankful for our church. She said she's been going to a church where she thinks the, the pastor is a Bible preacher, but she said he's soft on some of these controversial issues of our day. He does not take a, a clear stand on what the Bible says. I mean, it's a tragedy. That was not John Huss. And uh, I actually published a book in, in the Czech language, and I put six lessons to learn from the Reformers, and I left it on my, on my desk. But six le lessons to learn from the Czech, the Czech Reformers. And one of them is that you know, they didn't, they didn't, it didn't bother them if people got angry at, their, at the things that they preached because they knew that 
either they get angry or God gets angry. Who would you rather have angry? You people for telling them the truth or God for hiding his truth? So we must be people of the truth. We must be willing to live and die by the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus, when he prayed for his disciples, when he prayed for those who would believe in him, he said, Father, sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. So truth is important to God. Truth is important to Christ. And we see here in Jeremiah that when truth perished from the land, uh, so did the people. God sent them into exile. God brought judgment upon them. So if we want to preserve our country from judgment, you know, I was talking with Pastor Paul today, I said, you know, a lot of times we hear God bless America, but now I believe we should, we should say God be merciful to America. I mean, before God can bless America, God must judge America. And when you look at some churches, and that's only the first lady. I had another lady a couple weeks ago write me a similar letter about her pastor in Danville uh, tolerating the LGBTQ stuff. Um, you know, God is not going to, you know, God, in fact, if judgment is going to take place, like Peter said, it must begin in the household of God. If, if churches aren't willing to stand for the truth and to preach the truth, and we as Christians aren't willing to tell people the gospel and to share the gospel with people and to tell them the truth, then we should expect God's judgment. We should expect God's judgment on our lives, on our church, and on our nation, and on our families. And just as in the days of Hus, priests would call good evil and evil good, so we see today. So may we stand with John Hus and not be afraid of the truth or standing for the truth or preaching the truth or living or even dying for the truth. And I'm going to close with uh, my favorite quote by Hus. It says, Faithful Christian, seek the truth, hear the truth, learn the truth, love the truth, speak the truth, adhere to the truth, defend the truth to death, for truth will make you free from sin, the devil, the death of the soul, and finally from eternal death. I think that's a pretty amazing quote. So may that mark our lives. May we be valiant for the truth. And God wants us to be people of the truth. We see that in Jeremiah. We see that uh, through the ministry of Christ and the apostles, and we must be those who are absolutely committed to the authority of Scripture, that it drives all that we do and say. Uh, and even if it means one day, you know, even if it means one day we have to stand at stake and be willing to go down in flames. So uh, this is a really cool picture. I'm going to leave it up here so you can see it. But it may be a reminder to us to always stand for the truth.